When Ronaldo complained about the lack of respect and asked Paris to sell him for 100 million, he replied, don't bring me 100 million. Bring me the money I need so I can replace it with Lionel Messi. And that's all about Florentino. Paris calls Cristiano an idiot and a lunatic, Casillas a stupid puppy, and Raul a swindler. He easily makes sneaky deals. As a result, this guy with hair tied in Barca's collar, trolling Madrid, suddenly signs for the capital team. Something that Florentino only cares about money and power, but not football. Rumor has it that he once suggested Beckham play a right back and Zidane play central just to make room for new Galacticos. But wait, the reconstruction of perhaps the best stadium in the world, Santiago Bernabeu, is coming to an end, which is supposed to be the pinnacle of Paris' presidency. A presidency during which Paris was able to leave the club out of debt, survive the consequences of the pandemic, compete on equal terms with money bags sponsored by Shakes, and still remain the world's leading brand and club. So who is he? In today's video, you will find out what did Florentino really come up with Galacticos for? What was Madrid like before Paris? Who helped him become rich? And why does Florentino have shady schemes? I will tell you how he began to fight football and hacked it four times, each time discovering the trends way before others. We will look at his fifth attempt to change the game with the Super League and its true reasons. Paris is a builder, and not just because of the reconstruction of the Bernabeu. Florentino studied engineering in Madrid, oversaw a raw project in Spain, and even worked in the ministry. However, the young engineer was not satisfied with such a career, so Paris decides to go into politics and is elected as the secretary general of the new PRD party. He doesn't stay in his position for long. After the 1986 elections, PRD is dissolved. Therefore, Paris decides to change his field yet again. Together with his friends, he buys the bankrupt engineering firm Padros and not only makes it profitable, but also turns it into one of the largest construction companies in the world, ACS. So it's 1995. Inspired by his successes, Paris puts himself forward as a candidate for the presidency of Real Madrid, the team he has supported since childhood. He thinks everything will go smoothly, as it was recently announced that the club has huge debts. Well, who can beat him? A superstar from business and the great manager for the current president, Ramon Mendoza, who allowed such losses. But despite all the problems, Mendoza wins the election. Paris' first attempt to take control of Madrid fails. He returns to ACS. In 2000, Florentino decides to run for president of Real Madrid again. But this time, everything will be different. Paris makes one very bold move that brings him fame and realizes his dream of greatness. This move is a promise to sign Luis Figo from Barca. The first information about the possible transfer of Figo appeared on July 6, 2000. Ironically, on that day, Real Madrid defender Mikhail Salgado married the daughter of the new Real Madrid president, Lorenzo Sanz. We will talk more about Sanz later, but it should be noted that at that time, he was doing very well. After replacing Ramon Mendoza in 1995, Sanz soon won the Champions League with Real Madrid for the first time in 32 years, and in 2000, just two months before the election, he took another one. Add a few more trophies to that and you get a new presidential term for Lorenzo. Almost everyone was convinced of this, yet Paris had a different opinion. First, he gathers all the socios of Real Madrid. These are the people who have the right to vote and asks, if I became president, which signing would I like to see first? The room shouts, Figo. The Florentino calmly responds, okay, if I become the president, I'll sign him. And if not, I'll pay the membership fees for all 83,000 socios next year. So the decision is made, but how do you lure a Barcelona legend to your team? Of course, with money. First, Paris turns to Paolo Futre, a former teammate of Figo in the national team, and offers him to be a middleman in the simplest and, as it turned out, brilliant deal. If Paris wins the elections and Figo does not move to Madrid, then Luis pays a penalty of 22 million pounds. If Florentino loses, then Figo capped about 1.7 million pounds for himself. Then, to confirm his intentions, Paris deposited 44 million, the buyout closed for Figo, into the account of the Spanish Football Federation. The deal was done. Now, why did Luis agree to participate in this? The Portuguese player really wanted to extend his contract with Barca, but due to the presidential elections that same summer, none of the candidates had real power and couldn't give him a concrete offer for a new contract. 
When Paris made his offer, everyone heard about it, but no one, including Figo, took it seriously, just like they didn't take Paris' victory. Even Real Madrid's president at the time, Lorenzo Sanz, said that Paris was more likely to sign former supermoto Claudia Schiffer than to win the elections and bring Figo. So Figo agreed to take what seemed to be an easy 1.7 million. Yet all these people didn't understand the main thing. Real Madrid fans and socios forgot about the Champions League and other club successes when they heard Paris' promise. They were ecstatic about humiliating Barca with just one deal. Thousands of them voted for Paris. In the end, he won the elections and immediately fulfilled his promise. He brought Barcelona's talisman to Madrid. Florentino made only the first move but already won over the fans, got rid of competitors and really destroyed Barca with just one check. Look at the facts. The money received from this deal went into the new star transfers. But neither Mark Overmars or Emmanuel Petit from Arsenal could replace Luis or even establish themselves in the club. However, things weren't perfect for Madrid either. When Flo took over the club, he inherited debts of 3 to 400 million euros. So let's figure out how this happened and what it was like. I won't talk about all the presidents of Los Blancos, such as the great Carlos Padros and Santiago Bernabeu. Let's focus on the two predecessors of Flo that were mentioned in the video, Ramon Mendoza and Lorenzo Sanz. Ramon Mendoza. He was the club's president from 1985 to 1995. With him in the chair, Madrid won a record-breaking five consecutive La Liga titles and was considered one of the best teams in Europe at the time. However, they couldn't win any European Cups during the period. Even before Florentino, Mendoza started to have bold negotiations with stars, demanded huge amounts of money for TV rights and made one of the most scandalous transfers of the time, Hugo Sanchez from Atletico Madrid to Real Madrid. And it was him who defeated Paris in the 1995 elections, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. But he resigned from his position in the same year due to that, handing over management to his right-hand vice president, Lorenzo Sanz, who became the main man in Los Blancos for the next five years. Financial problems were compounded by image failures, as for the last five to six years, Madrid had bought very few stars, relying more on luck and hardly resembled a super club. To fix the situation, Lorenzo, being a successful businessman and a negotiator, started to assemble the first mini Galacticos, partially on his own money. Fredrik Mijatovic, Dower Schuker, Clarence Zadorf, Roberto Carlos, Christianin Panucci, and Bodo Igner. These newcomers, along with Fernando Hierro, Redondo, and Raul, created a powerful team and brought back gold medals to Madrid in the first full season of Lorenzo Sanz. Then they won the Champions League twice in three years, took the Spanish Super Cup and the Intercontinental Cup. But while the results were okay, Madrid's financial problems under Sanz became worse day by day. Despite Lorenzo's personal contributions, the team continued to lag funds. Los Bancos took out loans for new stars, but the idea didn't work. <laughs> yes, not everyone can succeed as Galacticos. It was reported that since 1997, the club's debt doubled. So Real Madrid was even on the verge of bankruptcy. All this, alongside Paris' promise to sign Figo, eventually led to Lorenzo losing the presidential elections to Florentino in the summer of 2000, who immediately began to fix everything. However, Paris did it extremely controversially. He decided to sell the land owned by Real Madrid, located in the very city center. With the help of the city council and not entirely clean operations, the club got rid of its land, receiving half a billion, and Paris also made a good profit. A new financial district was supposed to be built on the site of the former training base of the team, and the majority of the contracts were given to Florentino's company, ACS. Another victory for Paris at the beginning of his reign. But now it's not brilliant like the transfer, but rather murky. So it's time to tell you more about Florentino's dirty schemes and his dark side. Florentino's ideology can be described in three words, business, money, and power. So let's start with business schemes. The construction giant ACS, which we talked about at the beginning, was built by Paris with the help of government contracts and financial support from the Albertos and March families, both closely linked to Franco's dictatorship, which in turn once collaborated with the Nazis. It's already a bit shady. Moving on, the country's largest savings banks, Caja Madrid, also under the government control, not only helped ACS buy millions of its own shares, but also financed Real Madrid transfers. 
For example, a loan of 76 million euros for Cristiano Ronaldo. And this was during the financial crisis of 2009, when loans were simply unavailable for most companies. The second point is power. If you watch a Madrid match from the VIP box, you will see famous bankers, politicians, and businessmen. Paris has turned this place into a new center of influence where many important deals are made. But alongside recognizable figures, like a former Spanish prime minister, there are also very questionable ones. For example, an influential figure in the Spanish Chinese mafia, Gao Ping. And for the sweet part, let's focus on power. Paris even changed the election procedure in the club to sue himself. Now, candidates for the presidency must meet such requirements as membership in the club for 20 years, Spanish citizenship, and the bank guarantee of 15% of the club's budget, currently about 120 million. In theory, democracy and transparent conditions. In practice, pretty much only Paris can be elected as the new president of Real Madrid. Finally, the third point, United Business, Money and Power. Real Madrid is a Spanish brand standing above the government, Paris once said in an interview. And to some extent, it's true. Through the club, he boosts his influence and power in Spain, and through money and business, boost Real Madrid. The most famous example of this synergy is the transfers of the Los Blancos. During investigations, journalists found out that large international purchases by the club, Colombian James Rodriguez, Mexican Chicharito, and Costa Rican goalkeeper Keylor Navas, coincided with ACS receiving construction contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars from the governments of the corresponding countries. Coincidence? I don't think so. However, murky or cool Paris may be as a businessman, no one can deny that he's also a genius innovator. Florentino is constantly ahead of trends and has already successfully changed football several times. I remind you that when Paris took over the club, it was in a difficult situation. Despite playing the Champions League, Real Madrid did not bring in expanded revenues and did not have the global recognition it has now. Not to mention that the stadium was not only empty, but also in need of repair. In such a difficult situation, when it was necessary to sell players and save money, Florentino went against the system and hacked football. He felt that people wanted entertainment and stars. Therefore, Paris created the Galacticos. Following Figo to Madrid were the players such as Zidane, Michael Owen, Brazilian Ronaldo, and David Beckham. The Englishman was even taken instead of Ronaldinho, whom Paris considered too ugly. The transfer made it clear. Florentino pursued commercial rather than sports goals. After all, Bax was taken for the same position as Prime Figo. What were these goals? To buy the most famous and media-covered players, create excitement around them, and start selling various goods and broadcasts, as well as signing lucrative advertising contracts. But here is the paradox. During the era of Galacticos, Madrid's successes on the field were tiny. A few championship titles and only one victory in the Champions League, and that was in five years. Plus, a big imbalance in the team, conflicts due to inflated egos, and a lack of respect for average players from the leadership. Paris didn't care about the non-star Makelele, despite the fact that he was the core of the team's game. Look at how Chelsea played after his move. In any case, all of this had no meaning for Florentino at all. Paris succeeded in the main thing, turning Madrid into a money-making machine. But such innovation also had negative consequences. In three seasons, Madrid did not win a single title. Tension grew against both management and players. Fans were outraged. Players began to leave and Galacticos fell apart. All of this led to Paris' resignation in 2006. But this was short-lived. Very soon, he will return with his new ideas and recognition of mistakes. He will return to achieve success once again. But first, a new president came to sort out the situation in terms of trophies, Ramon Calderón. Under his leadership, Real Madrid won three major titles in just two years two La Liga titles and one Spanish Super Cup. I remind you that before his appointment, the club had been without trophies for three years. Ramon also assembled a good management team, Pedrak Majorovic, sports director, and Fabio Capella, coach, with players such as Van Nistelrooy, Cannavaro, Diarra, Higuain, and Marcelo. Overall, everything was going super well, but it ended again in a scandal. In 2009, Cadron resigned. The main reason was his involvement in the falsification of the Real Madrid presidential election. Vincente Baluda replaced Ramon, who was in charge for only 125 days until the summer when new elections were held. Well, how did they go? Sneaky Paris took advantage of the situation and, with no other candidates available, became the president of Los Blancos again on June 1, 2009. 
He didn't turn down his previous policy and in the first two months, he made several high-profile transfers, buying Kaká from AC Milan, Cristiano Ronaldo from Manchester United, keeping Calderon's promise and Karim Benzema from Lyon. Florentino made serious purchases every year because he understood long before everyone else that football was changing and money was changing it. And when the transfer market began to inflate to such proportions that it was already difficult for Real Madrid to compete with the old money of shakes, the club changed its transfer policy. It began to look for promising and relatively inexpensive players who could grow world-class or be sold with huge profit. It turns out that Paris didn't only correct another mistake, but also hop on one of the first trends, rational purchases and the search for those who will make up the backbone of the team for many years to come. The result of these thoughtful transfers is a top-class attacking trio, Benzema, Bale and Ronaldo, midfield Modric, Casemiro, Cruz, and defense Ramos, Varane, Carvajal, Marcelo and others. All these players have won numerous trophies and have maintained a consistently high level for a decade. And while the leaders were slowly aging, smart Florentino caught a few more trends. Why buy established players in their prime to play together for three seasons when you can take very young ones for 8-10 to ten years ahead? Here are Chamini, Camavinga, Bellingham, Rodrigo and Vinicius. Plus, if you start this process earlier, the veterans can still help develop the youth. Have you heard stories about Jude and his training with Modric and Cruz? But there is a very thin line here. And the third trend is to sell star players at the right time, without keeping them in the team for too long. We got a great offer for Ronaldo, sold. Casemiro Varane, Man United, here we go. Huge salary for an agent Ramos, goodbye. Benzema to Saudi Arabia, here you are. At first, everyone thought that the old man was in a hurry, but now we see that the players have passed their peak and played noticeably weaker in their new teams. Finally, the most interesting and unsuitable for Paris, let's call it a sub trend. He learned not to overpay for players. While Barca breaks transfer records and fails with Griezmann, Coutinho and Dembélé, Florentino does not give money to Mbappe and publicly states that with such an attitude, there is nothing for the Frenchman to do in the club. So, with money, trophies and the squad, Real Madrid is well equipped. Now it's time for entertainment and a new stadium. And this is the fourth trend called by Florentino. Look at this beauty that renovated Santiago Bernabeu. Uncle Flo didn't hesitate to spend a billion on all the work. It's covered with steel panels capable of displaying videos, besides a 360-degree scoreboard and a retractable roof, and an innovative system for removing the lawn from the field. After the games, the grass can now be removed on one of the six mobile platforms under the stadium. Besides the platforms, there is also a built-in ventilation, climate control, irrigation system, and an ultraviolet treatment. A real greenhouse on the ground. But what is even more impressive is not this engineering solution, but how much Paris intends to earn through his new asset. These extras and the greenhouse in particular should provide Florentino with new sources of income and over 100 million euros annually. The first is the leisure and entertainment area with lots of shops, food courts and attractions. There were rumors that Paris even negotiated with Disney to create a Real Madrid theme park, then the stadium would be surrounded by roller coasters. Unfortunately or fortunately, the idea had to be abandoned, but the fact that this modern stadium will still offer top-level entertainment and become one of the new tourist symbols of Madrid, there is no doubt. The second source of income is tickets. Santiago Bernabeu is one of the largest stadiums in Europe and brings the club 145 million euros per year, yet any arena has a capacity limit. And although Madrid added another 3,000 seats, it will take the team 100 years to recoup the reconstruction cost only through new seats. Not very good, is it? Paris also died the same way, looked at the schedule of the old stadium and was even more disappointed. Florentino took all this into account and after the reconstruction, Bernabeu will be able to host not only football games, but also technological conferences like Apple, NBA All-Star Games or tennis matches, for example, Nadal's forever match against Djokovic. Why would you limit yourself to just sports when the entertainment industry is so vast? With the help of the same greenhouse, Bernabeu can easily be turned into the largest concert venue in Spain with a capacity of 65,000 people. This idea has been confirmed by Taylor Swift fans who bought all the tickets for the singer's concert in three hours. 
yeah, she will be the first to sing at the new stadium. I hope now it's clear why Paris was rather frugal with transfers and invested so much in infrastructure. The new Bernabeu is the foundation for the long term. After all, football today is not just the game itself, but also a show, delicious food, comfort and entertainment. Football is sick. Top teams are losing value compared to some of the top US franchises. This is exactly what Florentino said when he presented the Super League. I won't retell everything, but I'll just remind you that 12 European clubs wanted to create a competition that could compete with the Champions League. But the sharp hate forced almost all clubs to abandon the venture and at least put it aside. And you know Paris is partly right. He perfectly feels how big sports are evolving and seems that people want more top-level games, which is why he decided on such an adventure. Hear me out. Legendary tennis players Nadal and Federer have played each other 40 times in the last 15 years. Djokovic and Nadal 59 matches over 16 years. For comparison, Real Madrid played against Liverpool 10 times in 68 years and only 5 times against Chelsea in the Champions League. Add to this the reports by Forbes, which confirmed that European football is really falling behind, especially in marketing, and losing popularity to other sports franchises from the USA. He also noted that it was his introduction of the Galacticos model at Madrid in 2000 that saved the club, and now the Super League is the same kind of act, but for football as a whole. He also said that in the 1950s, UEFA and FIFA were against the European Cups, but Real Madrid still participated in their creation and made football the number one sport. Perhaps Florentino is right. Personally, I believe that there is a lot of sense in Paris' words, but such global problems are not solved by one action, one new tournament just, just like that. You can say all kinds of things about Florentino Paris. He is self-made, but not without the help of influential people and shady schemes. Failed his Galacticos project but steered the club out of debt, was involved in fraud scandals, disrespected Madrid's legends, but built the world's best stadium for his club, found trends four times, applied them reasonably, but failed with the fifth one, the Super League. Like any great figure, Paris is a very controversial one. But you can't deny one fact. With the opening of the new Santiago Bernabeu, a huge 20-year chapter of Florentino's leadership of Madrid comes to an end. During this chapter, Paris achieved absolutely everything in football, so my answer to the question at the beginning of the video is clear. Florentino Paris is a genius. He forever changed our beloved game, and he did it several times, and perhaps right now the quietness with the Super League signifies not a failure, but another very clever plan. Who knows? Write in the comment section who is Florentino Paris to you. A genius, a madman, or a constant buyer of referees? You can also suggest topics and heroes for future episodes. As usual, it was a pleasure. See you soon. Know the ball.